Thank you for listening to the sermons here at Ascension Lutheran Church. Our worship services happen on Sunday mornings. 8.30 is our traditional worship service, and 10.30 is our contemporary worship service. We'd love to see you on a Sunday morning. You can visit us also on our website at www.alcrpv.org. We hope you enjoy the sermon. This day, we thank you for the privilege of being called your children. We ask that as we come into this room and hear your word spoken, that you will do something to us, something that we cannot do to ourselves. You will open eyes and ears. You will transform our hearts and our minds. You will give us a a new voice, a new heart, one that is based on your love for us. So Lord, we simply come in and we expect you to do the work. I simply come in and expect you to do the work. Because if it's about my ability, skill, preparation, the work here won't be important. But when your spirit infuses my words, when you come into this place, you open eyes, ears, and hearts. You chisel out new things in us so that we can be different. Lord, help us to submit to you now. We pray these things in the powerful name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, Hebrews chapter 5. If you have your Bible, open to Hebrews chapter 5. If you don't have your Bible, grab the Pew Bible in front of you and open to Hebrews chapter 5. If your Bible is too nice to write in and you don't want to bring it here because it's so pretty and perfect, buy a new Bible and write in that Bible with all the things that we get to say because we want to be able to um, really dive into these things we are also continuing our um, questions time. So if you could flash real quick, um, Gary, just the email. Remember that you can text or email the questions during the sermon, and we will have a moment in the sermon for us to do that. But we will text in any questions you have, and then I will um, try to answer them. So questions at alcrpv.org are the ways and the places that you will email your questions into. And if you get it in the middle of the sermon, great. If not, you can um, later just text it online. If you're watching, we would love to have your questions as well. I will answer them this week on um, Tuesday. I'll answer your questions. So um, please email them in, and I'll put a YouTube video up answering your questions. Okay. Okay. Hebrews chapter 5. Now, in order to get to Hebrews chapter 5, you have to go through Hebrews chapter 4. And this thought really begins in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. So let's start there. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so we may receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. Okay, now, this, if you do have your Bible, underline, star, highlight, repeat, repeat, repeat this section. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. Remember where we've been so far with this. We've been in this place where Jesus has been talked about as being greater than the angels, right? more important than the angels. He's, he's holy and he's altogether perfect. But also we have a God who is like us. And so we have this unique blend in Christ. It is this perfect coming together of divinity and humanity. Everything, and I've, I mentioned this last week or the week before, everything it is to be divine, Jesus it was. Everything. Everything that is to be human, Jesus was. There is no part of him that is lacking in either divinity or humanity. 
the staff and the council, I give out this book. I've probably given it to you at some point. We've read it before. It's called The Indwelling Life of Christ by Major W. Ian Thomas, one of my very, very, very favorite books. It's absolutely incredible. But one of the things that he does in that book is he has this line that always freaks people out. He says, Jesus is the only normal person to ever walk the face of the planet. And all of us go, no, 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 no. He was super normal. He was extra special. That's who Jesus was. No, Jesus was the way humanity is supposed to be. He was totally reliant on God and in utter dependence on God. And that is the way humanity is supposed to be. All of us are living less than human lives. Because we are controlled by other things other than the Spirit. He is the way humanity is supposed to be. So we have a God who is the God-man, who is perfectly divine and he's perfectly human, coming in flesh and being with us. And he is able then to sympathize with us in our weaknesses. There is nothing that you have experienced that God cannot sympathize with you. He understands exactly what it's like to be lonely, to be abandoned, to be tired, to be hungry, to be frustrated with his disciples. He knows exactly what it's like. So when you pray, when you lay yourselves out before him, he doesn't just go, boy, that must be tough. But he looks at you and says, I totally understand. I totally know what it is. I was asked once um, in the back of the church here by a woman who was going to see somebody who was um, in the process of their last couple of days and um, being around the family, and she was really feeling anxious about entering the situation. And I recommended that there's this absolutely brilliant video by Brene Brown um, that is called Sympathy Versus Empathy. And it's like a four minute YouTube video. I was wondering whether I should play it for you not today. Um, but I said, before you walk in that room, just watch this little video. And if you haven't seen it, YouTube, search it up. It's you know Sympathy Versus Empathy. But what the difference it does is it talks about sympathy is us looking at something and saying, boy, that must be tough. Yeah, that must be really hard to be that way. Empathy is when you're willing to think about a time when you felt that way and enter into that feeling with them. You have never felt the loneliness that they feel, but you felt lonely before. And instead of looking at it going, oh, it must be really hard to, to feel that way, to be willing to be vulnerable enough to say, I remember a time when I was really lonely. And I remember how it felt to be like that. I can be with you in that. Why? Because you have a time in your life when you felt lonely, when you felt angry, when you felt scared, when you felt abandoned, and you can enter into other people's hurt and be with them, and that is what really drives connection. Sympathy doesn't drive connection. It makes you feel small. It makes you feel little. It makes you feel kind of less than. Empathy makes you feel seen and known. And she watched this video, and she went into the room, and she came back the next week, and she said, I was able just to be in that place with them. For our pastoral care classes, I never am going to say the right thing. But all I can do is be there, be present, and sit with people in the midst of really hard situations. That's enough. We have a God who is able to be with you in your weakness.
pause and recognize how incredible that is. The God who created the universe, who with the power of his voice dug the deepest channel in the Pacific Ocean and raised those mountains that we get to look at. The one who spoke everything into being knows what it's like to be tired. Knows what it's like to look around and feel like nobody gets it. That's the God that we worship here and today. Isn't that different than what happens so often with us? We put God in this way out there box, right? God is out there. God's doing this thing. That's what's happening. Instead, God is with us, able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses. Let us, therefore, approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If you know that God is able to sympathize with you in your weakness, if you know that you can show up into this room, having done whatever you did the last week, having made whatever mistakes you've made, having done all of those things, and you don't have to hide yourself from him, but you can come fully, that's how you get the boldness, right? If you're afraid and you think, I I can't say everything, I can't do that, I can't reveal that, you're not gonna be bold. You're gonna be, you know, hunkering down in the corner. But if you know that no matter what you say, no matter what you do, no matter what you bring into this place, you're gonna be received and seen and forgiven, you can be bold. I do not think this is something that we as the church today in 2024, are well known for. We're well known for making people pretend and hide and look different instead of approaching something with boldness. Because we don't make people know that it's okay to be broken. It's okay to be hurting, that there's a God who sees them. But us who's here today on July 7th, 2024, let us know that we have a God who is able to sympathize with you in your weakness so you can be bold. And you can show up here and you can say, oh, I did that thing again. And God will go, yes, you did. I see you, I know you, and I love you. And you know what? You're probably gonna do it again. And I'll be here. I mean, isn't that different? This verse, we should remind ourselves every day as we drive into this place. Okay, God, you see me in my weakness, so I can approach you boldly. I can say the big stuff, the powerful stuff, the hurting stuff, because you get it. Let us, therefore, approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's the emotional move. Then he moves in this place of saying, we know the system of sacrifice. Um, Again, this is a book written to Hebrews. It's a book written to people who are under the Jewish system, who understand the Jewish system. What's the Jewish system? The Jewish system is, in order to take care of your sin, you take an animal, an animal of your house, an animal you've cared for, an animal you know its name, you've looked into his eyes, you fed, you bring that animal to the temple and you say, this is what my sin costs. And you give that animal to the high priest and the high priest sacrifices that animal so that your relationship can be made right between God and man. And it talks about this role of the high priest, the role of the high priest that the Jewish people be familiar with. Oh, he's the one who takes care of my sin. But he says this really interesting thing. He says, every high priest, they have their own sin to deal with. So they're not perfect. So they have to first deal with their sin. Then they can deal with your sin. So it's not a perfect sacrifice. But when he comes to Jesus, he didn't have any sin. So he was not worthy of being punished. He did not have to deal with his own sin. 
So when he walked into the sacrifice, he could do so totally for you. Totally for what you have done because he didn't have to deal with himself and his own sin. He is, and because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sin as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God. So Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Was Jesus saved from death? No. But he was heard. He heard the cries that Jesus laid out for the sake of his people. Jesus knows what it's like to really suffer. He didn't just pretend suffer. He didn't just act like he was suffering. But he really knows what it's like to suffer. Martin Luther has this brilliant line where he says, on the way to the cross, Jesus was the greatest adulterer, liar, murderer, thief that ever walked on the face of the planet. Paul says, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. He became sin. He was your greatest, worst, horrible deed. Jesus was that thing. He was that thing. And he became that thing for you. Why? So that you might become something that you're not, a son of God. He became that thing. 2,000 years ago, before you did that thing, he became it. So that it could be done. It could be finished. It could be washed away. And you might become the righteousness of God. He cried out with prayers and supplications, with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him. And although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. There's this fascinating way to read the, um, the prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus goes out of the city and he is going there to pray and he's leaving the upper room after the Lord's Supper and the disciples go with him and he's going there to pray. He stops at this garden and there's some people who have written about that and they've said, don't you think that the disciples thought, oh good, we're leaving town. Things are getting really, really messy in town. If you read the Holy Week story, it's getting brutal in Jerusalem for him and things are about to happen that are not good. And so they're probably thinking, great, we're out of town because Garden of Gethsemane is on his way out of town but he stops to pray. And you wonder how much of his prayer life was just asking God, God, can I just keep walking? Can I just keep going so I don't have to go to that tree? Can we just hide out in the wilderness and they'll never find me? Remember, there's no CSI. There's no fingerprints. There's no anything. He walks you know, 20 miles away. He's gone. But he sits in that garden and he prays. He learns obedience from what he was suffered. He sat there. Why? For you and for me. He became the very thing he hated. Why? For you and for me. All of this is what Jesus did for us. He learned obedience through what he suffered, having been designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, really fast as we're at the end, who is Melchizedek? There is this, um, it's, it's so weird and cool that Melchizedek shows up in three times in the Bible. It shows up in Genesis, it shows up in Psalms, and it shows up here. This guy, Melchizedek, who would almost be a throwaway story in the book of Genesis. 
But Abram goes to Melchizedek, and after winning a war, two kings show up, King Melchizedek and the king of Sodom. And King Melchizedek is there, and Abram offers a tenth of his wealth to him and gives him an offering. And then the king of Sodom is there, who he wants to give Abraham something. And Abraham says, no, I want to take one thing from you. I do not want to be beholden to you. And so the story goes, who is this king? Melchizedek, Malet is the word for king, and Sadek is the word for righteousness in Hebrew. So the king of righteousness, Jesus, is this Melchizedek. And Abram offers this tithe to him. And he's saying that line of priests, this is the line of Jesus. He's not like the other priests you've known. He's utterly different. He is like that priest who Abram, our great forefather, offered a tithe to. That's who he is. And then you wish, you wish that he would keep going, but he stops, right? And you can almost see his frustration. Oh, about this, we have much more to say that is hard to understand. And we're going, please say it, say it. But he goes, ah, you wouldn't get it anyway. I could talk about this and you all would miss it. Why? Because you are still little tiny babies in the faith. And you're like, darn it! Because I want to (laughs) know. I want to know what's going on with Melchizedek. But yet, it's so much more that we probably wouldn't even understand it now. And so we sit and we pray and we thank God that we have a high priest who is able to understand us in our weaknesses and who we can approach the throne of God boldly. Why? Because he learned obedience through what he suffered. He went to the cross and he believed that what God would do would raise him up. And so he obediently went to the cross for you and for me, the very one who had never committed sin and did not have to sacrifice for himself sacrificed for us so that we could approach the throne of grace boldly and with confidence. Okay, we're going to take questions. If you have any, email them in, and then we will um, put them up on the screen. So we'll take about a minute now, and Mark will uh, fill the room with some beautiful music, and you can bust out your phones and text or email the questions to questions at alc rpv.org that background and then are we ready for some questions there let's um put up the questions that we see come on on in gary you want to throw one up all right so how does jesus's priesthood compare to the levitical priesthood so great question so the levites were the priestly um group so The 12 tribes of Israel happened, 
and they were uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob's kids. Jacob was renamed Israel in that wrestling match. Israel has 12 tribes. One of them is Levi. The Levites end up being the priestly tribe. They don't get any land. So they don't have an opportunity to work the land to support themselves. They are supported only by the sacrifices. So when the, the people would come in and they'd sacrifice an animal, the Levites would get that animal and they would then use that to feed their families because they don't have land to take care of their own families. So Jesus' priesthood is different than the Levite priesthood, which is the point he's trying to make. The Levite priesthood was there for sinners so that they could have a way to be redeemed. And really, it opened up a spot in our brain large enough for there to be sacrifice as an idea of payment for sin. Then Jesus came, who was not of the Levite priesthood, of the priesthood of Aaron. He was of this Melchizedek priesthood, this one who Abram sacrificed and gave a tithe to. So he is this separate idea of this priest who is able to take care of the sin problem because he doesn't have to deal with sin of his self like the Levite priesthood had to dealt with, okay? So it's a separate Melchizedek priesthood that is Jesus, and most people would argue that Melchizedek was Jesus. He was a priestly sighting of Jesus in the Old Testament. Okay, wonderful. What else? What does it mean that Jesus learned obedience through suffering? Um, this is that, that idea of the garden, that when Jesus is in the garden and he is praying to God, that that suffering of both physical suffering and this is one, this is one of the questions that I have for Jesus when I get to heaven, okay? This is one of the big ones because I don't fully understand what it means for Jesus to be sin and still be the son of God and the second person of the Trinity, How can he become sin and still be divine? All of that magic that happened there is something that I want to go to Jesus and say, what does that mean? How'd you do that? Were you cut off from the Trinity at that point? Did God really forsake you in that moment? What does it mean that you really became sin? Because the scripture doesn't tell us he was like sin, but he really was sin. So that combination for me is one that I want to go to Jesus and say, "Uh, tell me more, because this is one of my great questions that I have too. So how was he able to truly become sin while being the son of God? But what we do know is that in the midst of there, he was obedient to the call, which was to go to the cross. Remember, He knows what it's like to be human. We do everything we can to avoid suffering. Amen? (laughs) Right? He's like that, but he's obedient through that call. Great question. Last one. Was the significance of Jesus being designated by God as a high priest? I, I really think this is where Hebrews is a brilliant book. Because it is giving us things in the Old Testament that the people of God would have understood and then saying, Jesus was like that, but greater. So when you already have a spot in your brain for a high priest offering sacrifices for sin, Jesus can be like that, but greater. And so then you can say, okay, I understand that there's a high priest, But now I know that there's a high priest who doesn't have to deal with his own sin. And Hebrews makes it clear that all of the Old Testament was opening up these new ways of thinking so that Jesus could come and be greater and fulfill it. Now here is, I think, the interesting thing we talked about in the Bible study earlier is we all have a hard time shifting from the way it was to the way it will be. And I have a hard time, I mean, this is one of the things that Emily and I have learned over being married for 15 years, is that when one of us changes plans on the other person very quickly, it it messes with the other person. I don't know if you've noticed this in humanity, but Emily will say like, well, now I'm thinking we're doing this thing. And I'm like, wait a second, 
we had just gotten this planned, and you know, she's been thinking about this. I haven't thought about it. And so now we're just a little bit better. Not perfect, but just a little bit better about saying, just give me a second to pivot. I just need to reassess like, what's going on now. That's not a bad plan, but I just need to reconsider that. Imagine, though, thousands of years of Old Testament stuff and your sacrifices, the law, all of that. And Jesus says, that was good, but this is better. And you go, hold on. I need a second to pivot. Because this is a lot to take in. And a lot of people couldn't. And I think the same is true of us. We get caught into our patterns and God may be breaking us out to new things. And we just need to say, Lord, I believe you're in that thing. Just give me a moment (laughs) to get my new thoughts on that. So I think this is what's great about the book, but it's also one of the things where we should have sympathy for those who were called to this new thing that they've never seen before. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this congregation. This has been so much fun and such an incredible gift to be able to be challenged, to think, and I thank you for the book of Hebrews. Lord, this book is, that line that we study today is worth all of this that we have a God who is able to sympathize with us. You are not far away, but you are in this place, in this room. Lord, help us to acknowledge that. Help us to believe that. Help us to be people who are willing to submit to that. And so, Lord, as we come to this table, let us do so boldly. Let us not pretend that we are perfect. Let us not think it is because of our good works, our good deeds, that we are worthy of receiving this meal. But let us acknowledge it is because of you, your work, and your deeds that we are able to receive this here and now. Amen.